Good afternoon uh, from New York. And my name is Eric Chen, and as chair of APA Division 49's Diversity Committee, I would like to welcome you to our fifth, uh, sorry, welcome you all to our fourth diversity presentation. Uh, please note that this presentation is being recorded. The recording and the presentation slides will be made available later on our Division 49's uh, YouTube channel, where you could find our previous diversity presentation recordings as well. After this presentation, we will have two more diversity presentations this year. I'm sending you this, uh, I'm sending you now the link to our diversity uh, division 49 uh, resources link in the chat box shortly. After you click the link, you will find more detailed information about all diversity presentations and our division 49's YouTube channel. Now I would like to say a few words to introduce our presenter. Nathaniel Wade is professor of psychology and director of training for the counseling psychology program at Iowa State University. After four years as a substance abuse counselor, Nathaniel attended Virginia Commonwealth University, where he uh, solidified his passion in group therapy. He received his PhD in 2003 and started as a faculty member in the counseling psychology program at Iowa State that same year as a licensed psychologist and certified group psychotherapist. He has balanced his efforts between research, theory, and practice. He started a department-based clinic focusing on group therapy in 2005, in which he runs therapy groups, trains doctoral students, and conducts research. When not at the office or spending time with his wife and two kids, Nathaniel's primary passion is soccer, where he uh, both coaches and uh, plays as well. So without further ado, let's welcome Nathaniel. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming and joining. Um, I said to, to Eric before most of you got here that I was really grateful for this opportunity and appreciated him reaching out and asking uh, me to do this. Um, it's a great um, opportunity for us to, to continue to think uh, and talk about the different ways in which identities show up in group. And so one of the things that I've spent some time on uh, in my research and in practice is focused on uh, religious and spiritual identities and how those show up uh, in group therapy. So I'm very excited today to talk with you about uh, that topic. So quick agenda, uh, three things kind of I would love to, to talk through and, and um, uh, uh, to do today. Basically, I want to talk a little bit about uh, group members as um, um, the religious and spiritual uh, identities that they bring to group. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about religious and spiritual group content. So as that shows up as a topic and how to work with that therapeutically. And then if I can keep myself to time, I would love to uh, offer uh, time for a Q&A and even just group discussion, um, just to open it up and, and be able to engage together. Um, I see so many folks coming in and I wish, you know, I'm kind of like, oh, let's scrap this and let's just hang out and talk about this. But I guess that's not quite the way it's set up today. So <laughs> we'll do that. Maybe toward the end, we'll have opportunities to engage together. So that's kind of my agenda. Um, all right, let's see. So I also want to uh, be upfront about kind of the scope of my talk. So what I'm really focused on or, or kind of maybe my bias as I come to this presentation is really about focused on uh, process oriented psychotherapy groups uh, that have mixed membership uh, based on religious and spirituality uh, identities, perhaps. Um, and that's not necessarily focused on religious and spirituality as a central theme. So there are lots of great groups. There's uh, even several published programs on offering spiritually oriented groups, uh, offering specific kinds of groups for particular religious, uh, religious identities. So, and those are great, um, that's not my focus. My focus is really about what happens when psychotherapists are in kind of general process groups with mixed membership and religion comes up or uh, religious identities become salient. And so that's really what I'm uh, thinking about when I uh, go through the material with you today, okay? All right, um, 
a couple of things in terms of uh, kind of the scope of the talk in terms of how we might be a little limited for today. Um, we only have an hour uh, and even less because I wanna make sure we have some time for question and answer at the end. So we are certainly limited. And so my goal is trying to keep myself from being too uh, grandiose about what we try and get done today is uh, really to lay a foundation uh, in this area, um, to raise awareness for folks uh, who maybe haven't uh, had much time to think through or, or uh, much expertise in this area. So just basically raising some awareness and then ultimately motivating some interest. I would love at the end of this uh, for, for most of you to be motivated to maybe do some more reading, uh, do some more conversations with colleagues, with students, um, and uh, supervisors uh, about these topics. So that's kind of, we'll keep that in mind today as, as we go through uh, the material. Okay, so where I'd like to start, I have basically three parts to the talk today. The first part is to look at uh, diversity among uh, the group members. So basically looking at it from an identity perspective, uh, and then we'll look at group content uh, and how it might show up in group. And then uh, I'll do part three as a, a section I call, so what? Like, what do we do then? Um, and so we can start here with this idea of religious affiliation. So um, this is focused on the US. This is from the Pew Research Center. They did a, they, they do periodic uh, surveys uh, of religion in the US. Um, this was from 2014. Uh, they surveyed a representative sample of 35,000 uh, US uh, uh, residents, I believe is what it was. And so you can see kind of the, the breakdown that they found. And this is, this is probably very close to what it is in the US. Um, with 70% of the US uh, uh, claiming some form of uh, Christian affiliation, uh, the next largest group, single group, would be uh, the unaffiliated groups. So these are folks that, that don't connect with um, a particular religion, uh, and some of those will certainly be non-religious or, or will be atheist or agnostic, but then there's also a large section of those uh, who also are interested in spirituality or have different kinds of approaches that just aren't specifically affiliated with any kind of group. Um, and then you can see breakdowns of other groups, the Jewish, uh, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, and then in other groups. Um, so, with that, we want to think, well, that looks pretty homogenous, you know, 70%. Well, um, we can break that down further if we think about uh, and, and recognize that Christianity as a broad label is, is pretty um, diffuse or covers a very large range of experiences um, and identities for people. And so as we break it down, you can see a quarter might uh, align with an evangelical Protestant faith, 20% um, Catholic. 15% uh, would be more of a mainline Protestant. 6% um, are affiliating with a historically black Protestant movement. And then you can see other smaller uh, Christian groups like uh, Mormon, Orthodox Christian, Jehovah Witness, uh, et cetera. And so again, this helps us to see a little bit more of the nuance uh, and, and the diversity even within a, a broader Christian faith. Um, and of course, one of the things that we, we know, or, or at least for me, that I need to be continually reminded about with any kind of diversity issue is there's probably as much uh, difference and diversity within groups as there are between groups. So even if a group is, oh, well, that's a Catholic, uh, there's a lot of diversity in the way in which people experience Catholicism and practice Catholicism. And so we also want to keep that in mind um, as well. Okay, from the same study, um, if we look at not just their affiliation, but be beliefs, um, the Pew Research Center uh, suggests that uh, about 83% of the US uh, respondents expressed a belief in God or a universal spirit. That's more than eight out of 10 people. That's a lot of people that are gonna express some kind of belief in, in uh, a universal spirit or divine. 53% uh, uh, say that religion is very important to them. Um, and so this, again, doesn't even capture those folks who would be, um, would, would value highly spirituality, but not religion. And we know that that's a growing demographic in the U.S. Um, but just to look at folks, um, over half of folks um, in the U.S. are going to say that religion is very important to them. And we could go one step further in terms of behaviors. Uh, over a third are attending services every week. So, you know, 
that's a lot of folks that are going to religious services every week. And again, like I said, we can break that down further in some of these groups. If you're working with a Jehovah's Witness, 85% of Jehovah's Witnesses are going every week, according to this survey. 77% of Mormons. Uh, and with evangelical Protestants, that number is still 58%. And with historically Black Protestants, you have 53%. Um, and so you know, based on these um, uh, data alone, that um, if people are aligning with these particular faiths and, and um, kind of identifying that way, they're likely uh, to say that religion is very important. They're likely to attend uh, services. And so this is kind of a um, kind of the implication of that in my mind is um, many of your group members are going to have uh, religious or spiritual commitments. Um, and if they don't currently, they will most likely have had some kind of significant exposure to religion. Um, and so paying attention to that, I think, is really important. Um, I should also say, uh, and I didn't put these data in, but um, one of the really fascinating things about it from a psychology perspective. So those of you who are trained in psychology as psychologists, um, the data show that um, psychologists are the one of the least religious groups. And so there's this really um, important, I think, divide between psychology servers and uh, the people that they serve in terms of just kind of demographics around religion and spirituality. And so it's easy for us in our psychology worlds, oftentimes for folks who aren't affiliated to feel like, well, that's kind of the norm. I mean, most people aren't because I'm hanging out with a lot of psychologists. Well, that's not the case probably for a lot of your clients. Um, another implication of these kind of survey basic data is that uh, many are likely to hold uh, religious or spiritual commitments that are important to them and important to their daily functioning. And so finally, then we could also um, conclude that group members are likely to differ on a range of religious and spiritual identities or, or dimensions. So um, I talked a lot about affiliation here in terms of showing you the pie graphs, but we can also look at religion um, in terms of their commitment to their religion or the salience that it plays for them. And that varies uh, across people, their beliefs just because you know a certain affiliation about a client doesn't necessarily mean you know all their beliefs. Um, those, uh, you know, the data show that really um, varies among folks, even within a religious uh, affiliation. And then, of course, their expression of it can change and can vary. And so we're likely to have group members that are going to have a mix. You might have a whole group. You know, again, I'm coming from Iowa, um, so it's very common for us to have a, a group of white folks, Christian background, even mostly Protestant perhaps, but even in those groups, there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of variation. And of course, for those of you who are coming from larger metropolitan areas, the diversity will be even, even much richer uh, in that uh, regard. Okay, so I wanna do a little data detour here uh, really quick. I can't help myself, but I'm gonna try and keep it really short. Um, but basically uh, I wanna, report on two studies that we've done. This was uh, the first one here that I'm gonna talk about were group uh, members. These were 164 group clients from nine university counseling centers. Um, and the counseling centers were from different parts of the region, uh, different parts of the, uh, the nation. And we basically just surveyed them on their preferences about uh, religion and spirituality in, um, in their groups, the actual groups that they were in. And all of them had been in group at least uh, uh, two or three times. Some of them had been in group for quite a long while. So that varied, um, but we were getting a sense from them about their experience with this. And so what we found in terms of uh, preferences for discussing kind of a, one of the basic findings that we had um, that was that actually 52% of all these clients um, express the preference to talk about religion in their groups. So about half or over half uh, said that they were, they actually, not just that they were willing to do it, but that they actually preferred uh, to do that. Um, and then in terms of uh, spiritual concerns, that number actually goes a lot higher. So three quarters um, actually preferred to be able to talk about spiritual concerns in their group. So then what we tried to do is uh, we had several variables that we used to predict those preferences. So um, we had preference kind of on a, on a continuum um, and uh, we were predicting their preferences with several things. 
Uh, and one of the things that predicted it was their, the group members' religious commitment. So as you would imagine, group members who were more religiously committed were more interested in discussing uh, religion in their groups. Group members who had current religious struggles uh, were more interested in discussing religion in group, as you could imagine. Uh, and then this one I thought was very interesting. The frequency with which the religion had been discussed in their group already predicted whether they preferred to talk about it. So the first one, members religious commitment, I see that as kind of like a trade or disposition, right? We're not gonna change that in our clients necessarily. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just what they bring to, to the group. Um, their religious struggles I see as more of a contextual issue that they're bringing from their life. But the last one is actually a group related thing. Um, this is what's happened. So if, if a therapist is more likely to open this up, if uh, clients in the group are more likely to bring it up, then it appeared based on our data that people are more likely to prefer to talk about it, perhaps because they've seen like the power in it, or perhaps they've seen, oh, we're allowed to talk about this, or this is something that's useful. So that to me was a powerful one as a therapist uh, who would be in group. And that's something that I could actually have a, a pretty significant uh, impact on. And then we also looked at, we split out in this study, religion uh, discussions from spirituality discussions. And so preferences to discuss spirituality, uh, the same three predicted that as well. And the addition of group member uh, spirituality. So we measured spirituality separate from religious commitment. And in this case, uh, group members' spirituality also predicted their preference to discuss spirituality uh, in their groups. Okay, and then uh, the other study I wanted to share was from 2012. We looked at uh, 242 experienced group therapists and um, we wanted to see what do they do? What do they think is a, uh, appropriate? You know, those sorts of things. We actually went through uh, the American Group Psychotherapy Association um, and the sample just shock me um, in, in terms of experience. And I should have pulled these specific data now, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's the average, eight, uh, average amount of experience, I think was something like 15 or 20 years uh, in our sample. So this was not just a bunch of uh, brand new counselors, this was people who had been doing therapy for quite some time. And so again, basic findings here um, was that uh, many uh, RS, religious or spiritual interventions were seen as appropriate. Uh, by these therapists, not all. Um, for example, I'll give you, a, I don't have this in the slides, but a little bonus here. Um, religious uh, group therapists did not think it was appropriate to do uh, like uh, prayer, um, like verbal prayer in the group. So there was, that was like 5% said that that was appropriate. So very few, um, but a lot of them were seen as appropriate. However, they also rated uh, their use of these as very uh, low. They didn't, they didn't often engage in these interventions, as you might imagine, which also helped to motivate kind of uh, our work in this area to, to see what we could do to, to help people with that. So let me give you a couple of quick examples. Um, we asked them about, is it appropriate to bring up the topic of spirituality? Not just respond, we also asked that. Is it okay to respond to, their, uh, to group members who bring it up? And pretty much everybody's like, yeah, you can respond to that. But we also asked, is it okay for the therapist to bring up the topic of spirituality? And uh, three quarters of them said, yeah, that's appropriate. Um, and then about only 19% said that they do this at least fairly often. Um, do you bring up the topic of spirituality? And as you can see, very few do that uh, at least fairly often. We asked them about bringing up the topic of religion specifically. Um, about 61% said that'd be appropriate to do, um, but only 8%. Uh, did this regularly in their group. So very, very few. We also asked, is it okay for you to ask group members about their religious beliefs? Um, and about 50%, one in two, uh, said that that's appropriate. So that's kind of a more of a mixed um, rating there. Um, and then only 10% said that they do this at least fairly often. So asking about clients' religious beliefs. Okay, so that just gives you kind of a, a quick perhaps overview of kind of what some of the issues are, what uh, kind of how I'm thinking of it, some of the background we have in this area um, and how this has informed uh, some of the, the work that we do in terms of, um, and some of the suggestions maybe I'll make later about how do we work with religion and spirituality in the group. So part two, I really wanna focus on this idea of religion and spirituality as a, as a content piece 
in group as something that may may come up and, and be relevant. Um, and so I want to split this into three sections as well. I'm going to talk about religious and spirituality as a source of strength, um, religion and spirituality as uh, kind of adding to the burden that the client uh, brings uh, to therapy. And then lastly, I want to talk about uh, religion and spirituality and microaggressions. So if we think about religion and spirituality, um, there is a lot of research out there um, from a health perspective, from a, a mental health perspective on religion. Um, and we know that religious involvement is related to, in general, is related to better physical and mental health and even longevity. There's some really um, high powered meta-analyses that have been done that have controlled for a lot of things like previous health conditions, um, social economic status and things like that. And even after controlling for these kind of well-known factors, um, religious service attendance in particular, although there's other aspects as well, but religious service attendance actually predicts mortality. Um, and it's, it's pretty, uh, a pretty robust finding. So George et al. in two, 2002 uh, wrote an article, a review article about, well, why could this be? You know, what's, what's, what's happening here? And they came up with a few causal mechanisms uh, as, uh, that are supported in the literature or that are being explored in the literature. So these are four that they, uh, three, of, three of the four that they talk about. Um, one is social support. So by engaging in religion, people uh, can capitalize on social support. We know that social support um, is very helpful for people uh, in terms of their physical and mental well-being. Uh, they talk about coherence and meaning, that uh, religious systems provide uh, meaning for people's lives. They help them uh, to make sense of suffering, um, that it provides a, a sense of coherence in their life about kind of how to, how to go about living, um, that that's really important. And they also talked about just the, the basic one of many religious groups will promote healthy behavior. So they uh, have injunctions against um, uh, heavy drinking or drinking at all, uh, tobacco use, um, risky sex, uh, things like that, that directly translate over the course of someone's life to uh, being healthier. Um, and so those are some of the, the factors they come up with. I mean, there's, there's many others that, um, People have also suggested uh, there just wasn't as quite as much research on those yet as well. One that I find really interesting, just as a side note, is uh, Idler uh, came up with this idea of a non-physical sense of self, which is kind of based on the uh, dualities of a lot of uh, Western religions um, and talked about how um, perhaps by seeing the body as separate from the soul, that that may help people cope, particularly with physical disabilities or other kinds of experiences that they have, that they can see, I am whole, my soul is whole, and this body, which is separate from me and who I am, um, may not be, may not work in quite the way I want, but that separating those out somehow may be, may be helpful. So an interesting idea, there's a little bit of research on that, but not a ton yet. And so um, that's one that, that George didn't include, but I find really fascinating about why these are connected or, or how these are connected. We also know that religion and spirituality can help people to cope with stress. Pargament and his colleagues have been leaders in this field. Um, there's a lot of research on um, uh, how religion and spirituality can help people to cope. Um, and also some good research on the ways in which uh, religion and spirituality can, can make coping worse. Um, and so that, that is, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, and of course, you know, the religion and spiritual traditions uh, hold much of the community wisdom of the world. Um, I was just talking with uh, my group practicum class uh, yesterday and we, we got on this topic and uh, because of course I was planning for this and wanted their help and feedback, um, which they graciously gave. Um, but we talked about this idea of um, really psychotherapy being the secular priesthood um, that uh, prior to psychology's formal founding, where did people go when they struggled with grief and death and loss and pain and anxiety and depression? Uh, they often went to their religious leaders um, and their religious communities, and that's where they found mental health care. Um, and so there was much, there's so much wisdom that has been accumulated and kind of sorted through, uh, through the ages. Um, and that is still held in the religious and spiritual traditions. And so uh, the point here is there's strength in that, that we as therapists, if we're humble enough, can, um, 
uh, can connect to and help their client help our clients and group leader uh, group members to connect to. Um, religion and spirituality is not all good. We know that too. Um, it definitely can add a burden to people. Uh, people who are going through um, uh, uh, mental health crises and and needing care. Um, so I think about this in one way. We could think about it as when religious and spiritual systems fail uh, or don't do what they're intended to do for folks. And so uh, social support, we know that that's, like I said, an important one. Um, religious and spirituality systems can also create terrible isolation and rejection for people. Um, I think there are so many heartbreaking stories in the LGBTQ uh, community where uh, growing up in religious systems that felt connecting when they were young and ultimately were so rejecting and, and terribly uh, hurtful to people. And so uh, working with groups like that, um, we know that there's a decent uh, specific stigma of mental illness that happens within religious communities. So uh, folks who uh, are dealing with say uh, a depression, uh, a major depressive disorder, and then hear from their religious community that that's a result of perhaps their personal failing or their sin. Um, and get further rejected. So now you're, you're dealing with the major depressive disorder and you're dealing with the isolation on top and how difficult that can be for people. Um, and so the other side of that is the, the rejection is that insular kind of uh, tendency that some groups can take on. We think of that as like a group think would be an example of that. Um, often led by a, a really strong uh, insular leader uh, who limits information and uh, we could think of like the classic example is uh, Jim Jones and Jonestown and the, the, the massacre that happened there um, with 900 people uh, committing suicide or really uh, being murdered if you look at uh, kind of the document of that. Um, and so there is, a, there is a burden that's added. And I think about how group therapy can be such an antidote to this to give people, if we can engage in these conversations with folks in ways that feel connected and safe, to give them other ways of seeing the world, uh, to be able to see someone across the room from them who they have grown to care for, have a completely different view uh, about the world or about a particular religion and how that can help to open up our mind uh, and help give us a new perspective, uh, a real antidote to uh, these kinds of, of problems uh, that can happen within some religious groups. Uh, systems of meaning and coherence can fall apart uh, when our worldviews aren't big enough to contain our world, uh, our experience. Um, I've certainly experienced that in my own life of believing the world should work this way and then just experiencing the world that it did not work that way. Um, and that can be very jarring for clients um, trying to make sense of um, uh, their own meaning systems and, and their worldview and, and how that's being shaken. Uh, behavior systems, you know, so uh, religion doesn't always tell us to do things that are healthy. Um, sometimes uh, prescribed behaviors are not healthy. Um, kind of the classic um, description of this, Pargaman talks about it as problems with over control or under control that religion can do. Um, a classic example of over control um, uh, is a story of a, an eight year old um, autistic boy who was killed by his religious community because they believed his autism was a result of demon possession and engaged in exorcism, which included holding him down. And of course, as you would imagine, an autistic boy at eight years old being held down by people um, was thrashing and thrashing. The more he thrashed, the more they held down until they eventually suffocated him. Um, and so these are the kind of things that, you know, like these are, you know, it's dramatic, but it happens. Um, and that for sure are added burdens to people. Uh, who are coming to, to us for help. And so you can't have a conversation about religion and spirituality without including that aspect of both the strength that it provides and the burden that it can create for people. And being aware of that and, and assessing for that uh, can be really helpful. Okay, so the third one I wanna talk about is the way in which microaggressions might show up around religion and spirituality in our groups. And um, as I do this, I wanna, uh, put a big shout out to um, Dr. Platt's work. Um, and she led off with the first uh, of this series and it was excellent. So what I'm gonna say here today is just a, a little nod, but I wanna say, go see hers. Like the work she did in terms of um, the, uh, the microaggressions, particularly around uh, race and ethnicity, 
a lot of that stuff can be used um, relating to religion, spirituality, a lot of those skills, and she's got a lot of great stuff in there. So take a look at that. Um, so microaggressions, what are microaggressions? Um, I think about them and, and Sue described them as brief, sometimes subtle or implied, uh, slights against or denigration of people based on membership in a particular group. So we can just uh, add uh, or think about that in terms of a religious or spiritual identity. So what would that be? A religious or spiritual microaggression is these exchanges that denigrate people based on membership in a religious or spiritual group uh, or for people who have a religious or spiritual identity. And so being aware of these in your group um, as a leader can be really important um, because it sets, it can set a tone. Um, another great resource here, and I have some resources at the end of the PowerPoint, so um, you can grab those uh, later. Uh, Eric will put those up on the website, but uh, Schlosser in 2003 wrote a great article on Christian privilege, super powerful, um, particularly for Christians <laughs> to read. Um, to be able to take a look at that and say, oh yeah, okay, these are maybe uh, hidden privileges or implicit privileges that I didn't even know I had as a Christian that is so useful um, to pay attention to and to think through in your own journey um, of kind of cultural identity, your own development in that, um, to pay attention to how that might play out as well. So uh, I'd like to give just a couple of quick examples of what this might look like. Um, so, uh, a microaggression might be only saying Merry Christmas to your group members during December. Um, the implicit message in that, like you say, oh, well, what's wrong with that? Well, well, a possible implicit message in that is that the norm is Christianity, or we are all Christians. Uh, other holidays from other religious groups uh, aren't welcome, don't matter. Um, and so that's, uh, again, an important to pay attention to what these implicit messages might be in these, these behaviors, these statements. Um, you might imagine a, a group member who shares an interaction uh, with Muslim neighbors and then rolls their eyes and says fundamentalists. Um, you know, that kind of stuff can roll off our tongue. We kind of like, oh, what, what just happened? Um, and the implicit message here, Muslims take their religion too seriously or, or Muslims are terrorists or dangerous. Um, we've seen a lot of that. Um, there's a, a, a really good report um, uh, article that I read uh, this this past week in preparation for today that that talked about uh, second to um, hate related crimes to race and ethnicity is religion and it's mostly focused on Jews and Muslims and so this is like this is a real deal you know like like people are experiencing this um, and and particularly Jews and Muslims in our culture have experienced a lot of hate. Um, and I, uh, I think it's really important for that we pay attention to how these statements and behaviors that people make tap into this deeper fear um, and deeper unsettled that they have as a result of a lot of rhetoric that we've experienced um, and a lot of uh, uh, actual behaviors um, that they have experienced and seen. You can imagine uh, somebody saying, uh, uh, one group member saying to another group member, you're an atheist, but you're such a moral person. Uh, and again, the implicit best message here being atheists are immoral or amoral people or, or atheists don't follow any moral codes because they don't have a religion that, that tells them what to follow. Um, and so that's another uh, possible example there. Okay, so I'm trying to keep moving because I want to make sure we have some time for, for questions, but uh, this is my part of like, okay, so then what do we do? So I'm gonna give you just a couple of points here. I'll probably go faster than I'd like to, but we'll keep moving. Um, consider assessing for religion and spirituality in your client. There are lots of um, established scales for, for doing this at this point. Um, feel free to reach out to me. If you're not sure where those are, I'll send you more than you'll ever want um, and give you resources and stuff. But um, you can do that at just simply about affiliation. You know, Are you affiliated with a religion or not? That's a simple question. Uh, you can try and get at things more like the importance that religion plays in someone's life it, through perhaps a measure of religious commitment uh, or other scales. You could talk about, you could ask about conflicts that religion and spirituality creates in the person's life. You may ask if uh, religion and spirituality plays any role in their presenting concerns. A few simple questions can go a long way in assessing uh, your individual clients and have a better sense of how is this going to play out in my group um, with different folks and different members. 
I'll also here, number two, encourage you to engage the group in conversations about religion and spirituality. So we did a case study in 2014 that we published in 2014 um, that came from uh, an experience we had in my clinic where um, we had a group member leave a group. And in their goodbye session, uh, that client uh, bravely shared that religion and spirituality was really important to them, uh, one. Two, they didn't know how to talk about uh, their presenting concern, like their psychological concerns, um, without including religion and spirituality. And then three, and this was the hard part for us to hear, um, she shared that she didn't feel like religion and spirituality was welcomed in the group. And I was shocked, I was like, wait, what? Like I do this, you know, like this is my research, how could this possibly be? So what we did is we went and we had all the video, uh, videotapes from the groups. Um, and so we had, this was the first member to leave in six months of the group. And it was a longer term therapy group, but just first member. And so what we did is we went back and we looked at all the sessions. We just, we viewed them all. Um, and anytime religion and spirituality came up, we, uh, we marked it down and we looked at the transcript and we tried to ask the question of like, well, what happened? Like, how did this client get this message that religion and spirituality was not welcome in the group? And never once did the therapists in that group say that religion and spirituality wasn't good. They didn't make any snide comments. There weren't microaggressions related to religious spirituality that we could see at all. But there was one thing that was common on all the times it came up. They never once mentioned it. They never once followed up with it. So they were kind of open, you know, like a good therapist. I mean, they were, you know, kind of like, oh, well, tell us more. But what they didn't do was ever say, tell us more about you know, your husband and how he turned away from the Catholic church, you know, what you just shared with us, or tell us more about this, this, the way in which you deal with grief and death and what you think, uh, and how that intersects with your spirituality, like you just mentioned there. Um, and so basically what I assessed it as is kind of like a, uh, what, what felt like a benign neglect was actually not benign for this particular client. Um, and so what I, one of the things that we say out of that case study was make it a priority at some point. So not always, there's so many different choice points that we have in group. Um, a client who talks about uh, depression and how that keeps her from being able to go uh, to synagogue and she has a hard time being around her parents. I mean, right there, you got three, at least three different things to follow up on. What are you gonna do? Well, what I would argue is at some point, make the choice to follow up about religion and spirituality so that you send the message that is also okay to talk about here in our group. Um, and so then there's the yeah, reference for that. Okay, so what are some of these questions that you might say? I, you know, I'm always, uh, I always find it really helpful when therapists or trainers or supervisors say, well, here's some samples. So I figured I would offer that to you all as well. So um, how might you frame this in a group um, talking with individual members? Well, you might just ask, what are your experiences with religion or spirituality? How similar are your current spiritual religious beliefs with those of your childhood? How have your religious beliefs been affected by your anxiety or your relationship concerns? How comfortable are you talking about religious spirituality in this group? What would make you feel more at ease to discuss religion or spirituality with the group? And of course, we can think about example questions for that you might pose to the group as a whole. You might uh, reflect, I noticed that when LaToya finished talking about the struggles they have with their spiritual beliefs, no one responded. What does this silence mean for us as a group? Spiritual religious topics have been implied in much of what you all have said today, but I noticed we haven't talked about them directly. What are the obstacles to talking about these concerns more directly in here? How would you all like to talk about religion and spirituality in this group? What hinders us from more explicit discussions? I love the support you all just gave to Bill. I noticed though, that no one responded to his sharing that his connection to God is one of the main things that has gotten him through this hard time. What does that bring up for each of you? So it's just some samples, some different ways to think about um, um, offering. And of course, this, they're just examples and, it's, and it, obviously I wrote them. So it's kind of framed in the way I would do group, but you all do group your way. So you know, think about the ways that you would do group and then how you might frame uh, some of these questions, some of these inquiries into these, uh, into this area. Okay, and then I want to end here um, just talking about a few general points about addressing these microaggressions as they show up uh, in group. Um, 
around religion and spirituality specifically. But again, this is uh, just some uh, starting point. Um, you know, we could spend, you know, probably hours together just talking about and, and working through microaggressions. Uh, in fact, there's a great article um, that was uh, published in the, Ameri uh, the International Journal of Group Psychotherapy, AGPA's journal, um, on training people how to deal with microaggressions. Super great if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and one of the things they talk about is because this is such an activating area for so many of us, particularly for those of us who are uh, white uh, identified and, and haven't done a lot of work around race often, um, that they really argue we need to practice. So create opportunities, create role plays, do practice. And so I would, I would just pull from what they're saying and, and say the same around religion and spirituality. We don't often have these conversations. I mean, if I had you all in person, I'd ask you, you know, like raise your hand, how many people got any specific training on religion and spirituality in your professional clinical training? I mean, I don't know how many we'd see, but probably not a whole lot. Um, so, you know, this often is activating for us. And so being able to practice this would be really useful. So, um, but these are some things that you wanna be thinking about uh, as you um, consider how might I intervene with microaggressions that show up in my group. So one is this process of, or, or concept of calling in versus calling out. Um, I find this helpful to think about that. How can we call people in rather than kind of, you know, blaming and, and, and trying to uh, almost like a disconnect, like, well, I would never be like that. And so why did you do this? Or why did you say that? Instead, this sense of really being able to stay connected to the members um, so that you might look for, um, as you communicate the impact that that statement had or that behavior had, you might also hold in your, your mind, what are the intentions? And maybe not even necessarily the intentions of why they said what they said in that particular case, although it might be relevant, but also the broader intention of the person in the group, being able to tap into past ways in which they have cared for um, the person that now they're hurting and be able to, to see the disconnect and help them to make that connection of how their behavior had uh, you know, a particular hurtful um, impact on this particular person. Um, one, one point I also like is this idea of trying to use or name your own experience of the interaction, um, being able to engage yourself. Um, you know, Joe, when you rolled your eyes and, and said like fundamentalists about your neighbors, I actually got really uncomfortable. Um, and, and it was, you know, I just want to share with you kind of how I saw that or how I felt about that. And it seemed like you were kind of lumping all Muslims together uh, and, and saying kind of something disparaging about them. And one of the fears I had about that was, we haven't really talked about religious identities in here. And perhaps there's some people who practice Islam here in our group and how that might be hurtful to them. Um, so again, trying to own some of that. This next one, staying rooted in your own values as you do this work, um, comes from Anastasia Kim's work. She put together a, uh, a model of like eight steps for dealing with microaggressions in psychotherapy. Um, it's really, really good. Um, and one of them is this idea of staying rooted in your values. And I really appreciated that. Um, again, because these conversations are often very activating for all of us, therapists and clients alike, um, if we can stay rooted in our values, it often helps us to find a way through that, that difficulty. And so um, the, the values can help guide, like, why do you do? Why are you doing this? Why are you trying to intervene in terms of microaggressions? Um, and also it might help guide, why am I doing this specifically with this client in this case? Like, what's my goal here? Um, and one of the things that, that Anastasia Kim says is you're probably not gonna change um, uh, like a, a group member uh, who's doing this in that moment, but you might one, be trying to protect a group member who has a, a religious or spiritual identity that uh, tends to be, um, uh, that is a, a minority. Um, you might uh, look to keep safety in your group. How do I create this to be a safer space? Uh, you might look to maybe be changing the attitudes and opinions of other people or educate other people in the group. Um, and so thinking about that, I think can be really useful of like, why are we doing what we're doing here? Um, and, and that can help lead the way uh, through that. And then I would also add um, being able to manage your own nervous system while this is happening. You know, what do you need to do to be able to stay calm, to stay grounded and find those things and be able to deal with them. Um, this certainly works when you're trying to intervene and help, but it might also be the case 
that uh, you might be the one who, who did the microaggression in, in the group and you might be getting feedback from a group member. Really important to be able to, to deal with our own defensiveness at that point and find ways to calm our system enough to be able to engage and hear and have that uh, feedback actually land for us in a useful way. Um, and of course that all uh, connects back to this idea of doing our own cultural and identity work, um, being able to have these conversations with others. Um, and so, you know, we talk a lot about uh, race and ethnicity and how important that is. Um, and I believe that's also important around uh, issues of religion and religious differences uh, and being able to do that as well. There's the article uh, about training therapists how to deal with that. And I did it. We still have some time. So uh, let's see, maybe I'll stop sharing. And what I'll do is if you're brave enough, you can, oh, here's the additional resources, by the way. Um, you can have access to those as well. Okay. So if you're brave enough and you want to jump in, we could do it that way. Or if you'd rather type a question, Eric maybe can help me uh, track uh, the questions there. Hi, Nathaniel. Yep. Mendel, Har Mendel Harwood speaking. I'm in Jerusalem, Israel. I just wanted to, uh, I guess, thank you. I just uh, published an article in the, in the International Journal of Group Psychotherapy that you referenced. And I cited uh, both your work and the work of a lot of the same citations that you used here today. Outstanding. Um, so just in a nutshell, uh, I do a lot of the group work that I do is mainly with Orthodox Jewish men in Jerusalem. And the article that I wrote was basically about how even in a population where everybody seems and looks the same, uh, we really are different. And I think as an Orthodox Jewish therapist may, working with Orthodox Jewish clients, what I found was is that people, even in our little group, also don't talk about religion and spirituality because there's an assumption. Uh, there are two assumptions, either that we all are the same in what we think and feel and believe. And in the ways that we're different, we're ashamed of the ways that we're different. So ironically, it's a group of overtly Orthodox Jewish, religious, spiritual people, and still we're not talking about it either. Um, that's so powerful. I mean, that's, I really appreciate that perspective. And that's so true. And, and then you think about the power of our groups, if we can just get beyond the hesitancy to share, the power of the group to reduce that shame and, right. and find that kind of universality and connection despite some of the differences. Right. So yeah. I'd be happy to share that article with you. It's, I think it's in the current edition of the of the International Journal. Oh yeah, I'd love it if you'd send it on. That'd be great. Love to take a look at it. Well, I, should I post the link here? Yes. That? Okay. Yeah, I'll that'd be that. great. Okay. Thank you I'll so much, Matt. Thanks. I think uh, Jonathan has a question or comment. Jonathan. Thank you. I'm very grateful to Eric and Nathaniel for presenting this today. Um, I have a small men's group. We only have four members, but we're incredibly diverse in terms of religion and spirituality. Uh, I'm Jewish and the members know that. Um, we have um, a Lutheran, a Buddhist monk, a member of the Church of Satan, and an atheist. And for those of you who don't know about the Church of Satan, they don't believe in, <laughs> they don't believe in an actual devil and they're actually very, they're actually an extremely ethical group. But we do have this incredible diversity for such a small group. And one of the issues that comes up is the Buddhist monks. Um, the Buddhist monk is, um, has a teacher who does a lot of what he calls uh, righteous wrath. Mm. And um, she can be incredibly judgmental. And um, on the one hand, this monk wants the group members to empathize with him about how judgmental his teacher can be. Um, but he also, um, and now I'm having one of these brain farts. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, he, he wants the, the members to empathize with how hurtful his teacher can be, but he also can't handle criticism of the teacher because she's, it, she's um, 
a highly evolved being. She, she, so she supposedly has enlightenment. Wow. And I'm pretty knowledgeable about different religions, including Buddhism. I mean, two of my favorite people on the planet are the Dalai Lama and Pema Chodron. And, um, and I know teachers don't need to behave this way, but I have to tread very, very carefully. And it can also be hard for the other group members. And I was just curious whether you have any uh, thoughts about that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you posed a hard one to me. <laughs> that's a, it's such a, I mean, first, it sounds like an amazing group. Um, that's incredible in terms of the diversity. Um, you know, but what comes up for me as you talk about that is that that cultural element of religion and spirituality and how it intersects with our identities, uh, just like that core sense of who we are. So I think, you know, when you say Buddhist monk, I have all kinds of associations about what that means for that person and um, to be connected with that teacher then and how that influences them. And so what is the impact of the uh, criticism? I don't know, perhaps you've already done this to explore with that person, have them talk about what comes up for them when the criticisms happen or, or what, you know, what associations they have with, uh, with that particular teacher. We've done a lot of that individually, but mm -hmm. the, the problem, the challenge is more in group. Yeah. Because on the one hand, he wants the group to empathize with him right. about how cruel his teacher is, but then he can't handle any criticism of her. Right. Right. I would love to just, I would love to do that work is like, when I notice the discomfort in him with the criticism, then really explore that. Maybe that's stuff you've already done in the group too, but I would love that person to have that conversation with the other group members. When, when you say X and X about my teacher, this is what happens for me. This is why I feel protective. And being able to have those kind of meta conversations about the process, I think would be really cool. Um, but oh, that's, that's a challenge. It's still a challenge. I mean, it's, religion and spirituality is, it's so close to, to what, you know, how people see themselves and, and what they believe and, and feel about the world. So yeah, great. Thank you so much. Nathaniel, uh, this is Dr. Platt. Thank you for the shout out earlier. Um, can I ask about, sometimes you mentioned Christian privilege earlier. Can I ask about how you balance intersectionality? Because sometimes people who have a very strong religious identity feels like that absolves them of being called in or called out about other ways in which they might be inconsiderate or maybe have committed a microaggression towards someone or, or that sort of thing. So how do you balance, yes, your group has some historical oppression or may face some oppression, but also, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't or be oppressive or hurtful. Yeah, wow, what a great question. Um, and I really appreciate you bringing in the issue of intersectionality um, to the discussion here. There's so much more that uh, we could unlock with that um, idea. So, um, you know, working with that, I think for me personally, you know, I don't have, I, I'm not going to own great expertise on this one, um, but I can just share from my own experience, you know, for me, really uh, struggle to try to balance those things and, and to help clients to think about um, uh, and to move kind of from identity to identity as they think and, and interact with the group, but then also as they share about their out, outside group life. Um, and so specific uh, kind of interaction or uh, kind of strategies for, for interacting there, I'm not sure, uh, Aziza, I'm not sure uh, how we engage. I think it's so like case dependent. I guess, you know, one thing that comes up for me is uh, you know, as I see here across the screen, you and I, and I just am very aware of our different identities. And so for me, uh, I think it would be really hard to, uh, so an image comes up for me of um, uh, an African American or, or a woman of African descent who's a uh, Christian and then interacting with me. So as a, a white male agnostic, how do I interact with her? I think that's gonna be different than how you would interact with her. Um, or someone else. And so I think, you know, I would uh, probably in my case, I would probably try more to, to connect with and hear from um, the place of disadvantage that the society has created for her. Whereas for you, you might have more leverage to be able to say, you know, kind of like, I get it sister, but there's also the Christian thing, you know, and there's that we have to pay attention to. And so I think contextually it does, does matter, but Oh, so good you bring up intersectionality and that's just another layer for us. 
I think my understanding of the, your point was also the, the also probably focus on the fact that we could actually think about our points of connection as well as our points of disconnection. If we could relate to each other, maybe in terms of our race, ethnicity, maybe with another member, we could um, connect with each other in terms of our um, maybe religion, spirituality, maybe in relation to another member, I could connect with that person in terms of our sexual orientation. So there are always these ways of connecting with others. Uh, so the point of your, uh, the point of intersectionality actually is an excellent way for us to, to understand each other's experiences. Uh, that's excellent, Eric, thank you. Yep. Such a good point, too. Uh, Gil, you have a comment? Uh, Gil, you okay, I unmute myself. Hi. First of all, thank you so much. This has really been terrific. You've done a great job in a short amount of time. Thank you've you. Really, you've sensitized me. I've learned a lot. And I want to say hello to all my friends from AGPA. Good to see you again. Uh, I have a quest two questions, actually. The first is, can you define intersectionality for me? I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, it comes from uh, Crenshaw's work. Um, and basically the idea is that all of us have multiple identities. And so we wanna think about the intersection of identities uh, when we do work with people. So people aren't just white, um, they might be a white female. Oh, and so we can look at, you know, that kind of a person, that client might have kind of um, privilege in terms of being white, um, might have less privilege as a Buddhist or as a woman. Oh. And so being able to understand the intersection helps a lot, particularly if you look at then situations where someone might hold multiple identities that have been uh, oppressed. And so it's not just that they are, um, uh, let's say, uh, Latinx, but they are also uh, an atheist or they're also um, uh, a, a gay and you know and so in that sense we help to to um, make our conversation uh, more nuanced and, and richer and understand more of the oppression and levels of oppression that people experience. That, that's very helpful because I've been wondering about that but I didn't have a way to sort of really categorize that that's that's really helpful. Here's the other question I had in your the, your counseling center study uh, it seemed like people really had on their minds the issue of religion and spirituality. And I was wondering how generalizable do you think that is, considering that you're working with a population which would be developmentally, it would be developmentally appropriate to think about aspects of identity, including religion and spirituality? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um... You know, you're pointing out the idea that uh, the group members that we tested because we were working with university counseling centers are typically the traditional college age. You know, you've got 18 to 22 year olds. And so maybe they're more sensitized to that because yeah. of the developmental stage. Um, excellent question. Um, I, I don't have data to support this off the top of my head, but what I would think is that you would see similar numbers. I think personally that it is transferable based on my own kind of anecdotal experience with uh, my clinic. We deal with a lot of uh, um, uh, middle-aged or older adults as well as college students in that clinic. And I haven't seen really any differences in those groups versus the college students regarding this. So in terms of um, uh, what I wanna say, like interest in being able to talk about these things, but I think the themes are a little bit different. So the themes at the early college, you know, college age, early adult are more exploratory. Whereas the themes that come up for folks in, say, middle age, um, the issues around religion are different. They're dealing with perhaps more grief. Um, they're dealing with generativity issues. They're dealing with meaning issues of like, how do I make sense of this whole life that I, I feel like in some ways I've ruined or, or squandered? You know, there's issues like that that come up that really intersect with religion as well. They're just different. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah. helpful. I actually have to sign off. I have a patient at 11, but thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Yep. Yeah, before you signed off, there was a, uh, a diverse presentation on uh, interge um, intersectionality. So I just sent you the link so you could watch the whole recording. And uh, so we did have this one, um, uh, I think, last month. And then I think Nathami also did a great job to, to mention uh, connecting to his presentation with the, the previous as well as the next presentation. 
by the um, NOEL in terms of the how to train uh, students to uh, address the microaggression. So I could uh, join us at the next presentation. I want to uh, take the opportunity to thank Nathaniel as well as all of you to join us for this really rich conversation. So, uh, uh, thank you again, Nathaniel. And then as I share with you all, I would have the recording as well presentation slides uh, available through the, our um, the division uh, diversity resources link that I just sent to you. So if you have any questions or you don't know how to find the information, just email me and then I would uh, communicate with you as uh, for the link to you. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Nathaniel. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. All right.